Well, have you ever been intimidated by a call in your life? Something God has called you to do, and you know it, but if you're really honest with yourself, it's overwhelming to you. It's above your pay grade. Um, you're inexperienced. You've never been there before, but you know that God's called you to do it. Anybody in here? Like, I think every one of us throughout life have been there, and I think there's really two major responses to that call. Either, you know what? Yes. It's, it's dicey, I'm scared, I'm overwhelmed, I am, I'm way out of my pay grade, but God, if you've called me to it, I'm gonna go. Doesn't matter what I feel like, if you said it, I'll do it. But then there's another response, and I've been there, you've been there, like you know God's asking you to do something, but you're like, uh, what had happened is I didn't really hear God. And I start making excuses, and I start backing away from God's best in my life. And because of fear, I don't step in by faith, and I miss the call of God. I fumble it. I was thinking about how <laughs> I've felt over or underqualified and overwhelmed throughout the years. And maybe you can relate to this. You remember when you first became a parent? Parents in here? I was talking to a guy recently. He's a new dad, and... Uh, he said, they're just gonna let me out of the hospital with this human? Like, don't I need a license or something? Like, and I was thinking about that. You need a license to drive your car but not take a human home from the hospital. What, what are we doing here? Or uh, newlyweds. I talked to a, a guy recently. He's been married just a, a couple months. How, how's, the, how's the marriage going? He's like, he's that's, isn't that great? And so you take two humans and put two sinners under the same roof and be like, good luck, buddy, you know? You're called. Husband, you're, what are you, you're called to love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Wives, what are you called to do? You're called to su <laughs> submit to your husband as unto the Lord. Ah, I know I'm called to it. I'm gonna back away. I'm gonna lean in. What am I gonna do? and on and on. You remember the first job you got or the promotion that you're like, there's no way. I'm just gonna have to fake it till I make it or something. And what did you do? Did you back down? Well, how about your young person right now and you're moving from elementary school to junior high? Remember that? Right. Or, or, or middle school to high school. Oh no, they're big guys there, big people. Or, or some of you guys are going to college right now. Some of you are like, yes, finally, get away from these idiot parents. Like, I'm, they don't know what they're doing. And I just started thinking about all the different things in, in my life that I had to lean in. Even though I was fearful, I had to lean in. When we got called to leave Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and start this church, talk about underqualified. No seminary degree. In my former life, I didn't start a church and lead a church. But when you have a call, you have to lean in. And, and the beauty is you have to walk by faith. Right now, by the way, right now, as I trip, I'm walking by faith. Did you know that? I was called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in a world where no one wants to hear it. I'm called to stand on this stage, and if I'm really honest with you, I would rather call a football game than I would preach the gospel right now. Because why? It's more comfortable. I don't know what I'm gonna say right now. And you're like, yeah, I know, I, I can tell. <laughs> but I have two choices, don't I? Back away? What are they gonna think? What am I gonna do? Am I, gonna, am I enough? Do I have enough? What am I gonna do? Or do I, do I lean in and go, you know what? It's uncomfortable, but I'm gonna do it anyways. And I wonder how many people miss out on God's best because of fear. I know I have. I know I've missed opportunity after opportunity because I wouldn't lean in by faith when God calls me to it. I gotta step in. Even as we speak right now, I'm leaning in. Are you leaning in? Are you backing away or are you leaning in? That's the message. 
so we can go to brunch now. We'll see you guys later. No. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? That's Jeremiah's debacle. It's his crucible. It's his position he's in. God comes to Jeremiah, and as a young man, we're talking late teens, early 20s, and says, hey, yo, Jeremiah, I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. Before, like, before you were even formed in your mother's womb, like I sovereignly called you to go preach a message of repentance to my people who are straying. <laughs> and Jeremiah's like, say what now? For, for context, you gotta understand, his dad was actually a priest. He's from Anathoth, this city that's a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. And a priest in that day would be more making sacrifices for the people, caring for the people, but not necessarily calling them out. <laughs> so Jeremiah's like, I can do the priest thing. I don't know about the prophet thing. And you'll see in the text, you read it, of course, already in Jeremiah 1, didn't you? When you were reading it, you were like, dude, like, he, and he starts kind of backpedaling a bit. Did you see it? You'll see it. He's like, oh, I don't know about this call. And then God leans in, he's like, hold up now, I'm God, you're not, I'm gonna equip you in the call. And if you'll step out by faith, I'll meet you right where you are at, and I'll speak through you, even in the tough times. And that's the message that I want you to hear today because it's been encouraging to me. Let's take a look at it. Jeremiah chapter one, starting in verse four. Jeremiah chapter one, starting in verse four. This is what the Bible says, the Lord gave me this message. And I was just thinking about that, like, how does God speak to you? That's why I love this church, uh, not because uh, Sunday, like, you know, all of a sudden something amazing, now amazing things happen, but you know the beauty of this, of this church is you get to hear the, the Lord's message every single day if you'll take this challenge. How did, and I'm just thinking, like, how did he speak to, to Jeremiah? Was it, Jeremiah, you know, like, how did he speak? The beauty is we can hear his voice all day long. The Holy Spirit, open your Bible. You can hear his message. And here was the message, verse five. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and I appointed you as my prophet to the nations. And I'm just picturing Jeremiah, what? I called you. I pre-programmed you with a purpose. And I'm just looking around this room. Isn't it, one of my favorite things is the, the beauty of the variety of humanity. Isn't it wild? Just look around real quick. Just look at all the different lovely people. Y'all looking good today. And you have different hair styles, colors. You have different heights, different weights, different financial statuses, different seasons of life. But, but here's the thing, God pre-programmed you for such a time as this, and it has a specific call in your life. You didn't have anything to do with it, by the way. Isn't it funny? Like, you weren't in your mother's room talking about, ah, yeah, I'm gonna make myself about six foot, about 185, I'm gonna talk way too much. Like, there was, it had nothing to do with that. I remember when I was young, I was, I think, Mom, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think I was in elementary school, and the assignment was, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And I wrote, I wanna be a God man. I wish I had the picture, I lost it. I think, did you give it to me? I, I, and I lost it, of course. You shouldn't have gave it to me. <laughs> you know that, pre-programmed to lose stuff. But it was interesting because I, I would have never chosen this for myself. Now I'm grateful because I look around and I see all million lives. It's so wild. I was with one of my buddies recently and he was telling me about his life completely changed by the grace of God. I didn't have anything to do with it though, but I was pre-programmed with a purpose. And that was kind of like God kind of like early on going, hey man, don't run. I was like, oh, that's for geeks and nerds. And I was like stiff arming God for a long time. I'm gonna be in athletics. I'm gonna be the cool guy. God's for nerds. And I was running for a long time. But sometimes you can't just, you can't outrun the sovereignty of God. He'll last you in. And bring you in. Good luck. 
it was wild because after I came to Christ, I, I had this burden on my heart. I was a part of this amazing church, met my amazing wife. You're looking good, babe. We met in Fort Lauderdale at this amazing church, and this church was radical. It just went right through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I'm like, I've never seen anything like that. And I had a, God put this, this woe, we say this, find your woe, you'll find your flow. You wanna find your purpose, find a problem. And what happens is a problem is connected to passion and now that becomes your purpose. And I was like, dude, I, I, it freaks me out that there's great people, Christian people, that have never read, read their Bible. They just come 1.8 times a month, get a regurgitated message, and try to actually live this abundant Christian life. It broke my heart. And God's like, well, you can complain about it or you could do something about it. And so it's like, okay, problem. I became passionate about it. And now, you know, what is it, 15, 16, what, how many years later you get to see this happen? It's purpose. So I would say this, because you, you're pre-programmed. God sovereignly called you to something. And here's, here's some indicators, some breadcrumbs for you. What freaks you out? What makes you upset? Or another one, like when do you feel most alive? When do you feel most fulfilled? Many times that's gonna lead you to your purpose. And so God says this to Jeremiah. Yo, Jerry, I'm gonna call for your life. I, I love... Uh, David penned this psalm, Psalm 139. Jot it down in your notes. I just want to read it because this confirms exactly what God's talking to Jeremiah about. Listen to this. David says this in verse 13 of Psalm 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Verse 15. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Look at 16, this, this is crazy. And I want you to put yourself in this text. God speak, like he's speaking to you. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Does that just boggle your mind right there? Every day, you didn't have a choice. It was laid out before you. It's funny because uh, Pastor Cap was just talking about this last week, how he was sharing, and thanks for sharing so personally and, and uh, transparently, how he's like, I can't run from the call of being a preacher and a pastor, and, a, and would I say a prophet? And I appreciate you leaning into your God-given call. We're all better because of it. Yeah, you can clap that. Go ahead, Todd. <laughs> Father Todd. Let's go, baby. And I want you to think about that. You're, you're made for a specific reason and a call. And God's speaking to you. Maybe he's reminding you of something because you've backed away for a while and he's bringing you back. Maybe, maybe you, you grew up in church and you left and now God's started to bring you back because you got thrown off by that church because it gave you a bad picture of who God is. And so you threw out the baby with the bathwater. Maybe it's time to come back to the true God and just follow his word and go, hey, men are gonna fail you, but Jesus never will. Maybe that's what's happening. So this call, he gets it. And of course, Jeremiah right away is gonna be like, sure, God. Where is he? Verse six. Oh, sovereign Lord. <laughs> There's another translation. I think it says, ah. Oh. That's all it says. Something like that, ah. Oh. You ever got that? Like, ah, oh, I shouldn't have come to church today. Hey, ah, oh, I said. Listen to what he says. Watch this. I can't, that hit me. I can't speak for you. I'm too young. I can't, and I want you to fill in the blank, okay? Everyone, this is an exercise for everybody at church today. Write it down. I'm too, or excuse me, I can't fill in the blank according to your call. I can't fill in it in. In Jeremiah's case, speak. Why? I'm too, then fill in the blank. I want you to think about that for a second. And really, it's interesting when I was studying this because I, I was thinking to myself, on one side of the equation, I like it 
because Jeremiah disconnected from God's power and anointing, he can't do it. So I like that part of it. You know, humility to me is the key to ministry. The minute like you go, yeah, God, you made me pretty awesome. You should be able to use me in a vast variety of ways. That's the first way to be disqualified for ministry. But, but if you're like, oh, oh, sovereign Lord, there's no way I can do this. I think, there's, I think there's beauty to that because God shows up and then he's the only one that gets the glory. I love that. However, Dave, I lo- there's, there's something about though when we back up and, we, and it actually becomes an excuse. I, it's, it's wild. I, excuses are like armpits, man. Like everybody has them and they all stink. And, and I think that, that it's one thing to walk in humility and go, God, I can't do it. He's like, yes, but I can. It's a whole nother thing to go, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, doesn't God, even with your luck, and we're backing away from it. Those are two different things. And what I've found in my life, a lot of times my backing away is out of insecurity and fear. And I remember specifically one of the, pivotal points in my formative years that brought in deep insecurity was in seventh grade. I'll bring you in. Some of you guys have heard the story, so I apologize, but this was deeply impactful in a negative way, and I'm wondering if you had a similar experience. It was seventh grade. My favorite sport was basketball. One of the basketball fans in here anywhere? Come on, let's go, baby. Three, great. You guys, uh, sweet. (laughs) Appreciate it. And I was like, dude, I'm, gonna, I'm Michael Jordan. One day, I'm being in the NBA. In seventh grade, I went to try out for a traveling select team called the Gladiators, where my old people at Omaha, you remember those? Powder blue and red unis. Like, you, you went on this big bus. You were big time. And I'm like, I'm, I crushed the, the, the tryout all weekend long. I felt good about it. I was leaning in. I was making shots. And back then, the way you knew how you made the the team or not, they didn't text you, they didn't email you, they had a white piece of paper they taped to the wall after the tryout, and they had names listed in alphabetical order. And so my last name is Dachshund, it's it's with a D, D like Delta Dachshund. So you know, what you do is you start at the top of the list, and you go down. So I'm like, A, cool, he's in, great, boom, B, D, D, there's no docs in there? They must have missed something. And I promise you, I turned around, and my coach said, hey, Todd, can I talk to you for a second? Oh, no, he's going to say, oh, I just, we, we had a typo, you know, we just missed it. <laughs> I went over there, he said, Todd, you had a great tryout, but you're too small. I was already super insecure about how small I was. I would wear like two shirts, you know, I'd wear the shoes that were, had a little more, to this day, this, I'm really not 6'2", I look 6'2", I'm really six foot, but back then I was, I'm too, And what's super interesting, this is, I'm messing around, but I I promise you, many of you today are backing away from a God call because of insecurity, and it was a lie of the enemy that sent your way, and you're believing it right now. And I would just say, come on, listen, some of you have not come to Christ because you're worried about what your friends will think. You're, you're, You're so needy to be in the in crowd and to be accepted You know deep in your heart that you're called to give your life to Christ and make a difference, but you're backing away right now. Can I just say this real quick? When you step into eternity, your friends will not be there, but God will be. You're like, cool out, pastor. Hey, I'm just trying to be available to God to help some of y'all. I can't. I'm two. What are you missing out on? What am I missing out on? He said, I can't speak. I'm too young. Do you remember uh, Moses? Moses said the same thing. 
God uses Moses to free his people from Egyptian slavery. (laughs) And it was so crazy because he looked at Mo one day. He's like, hey, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and just demand, let my people go. And you remember what Moses said? I'll show it to you. I think it's Exodus chapter four. Watch this. But Moses pleaded with the Lord. Oh, Lord. Does that sound familiar? Oh, Lord. I'm not very good with words. I've... I've never have been, I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. What's he doing? He's backing away. It's funny, too, if you read the text, he's like, how about Aaron? I mean, Aaron's got game. Sometimes I'm like that. How about Mike? How about Cap? I got zero game. I got tongue tied. I'll just give you a secret. My mind, I've had too many concussions and bong hits. So sometimes like there's a disconnect in my mind and I'm like, ah, I'm on stage, God. These people are waiting to hear something. And I'm like, I don't know what to say. I get tongue tied. Let me, sorry, this is just me. This is trying to be me, trying to be free. Um, Let me, by a show of hands, real quick, how many are deathly afraid of puff, public speaking? Raise your hand. Okay, how many young people, young people deathly afraid of, okay, hold on, look around real quick. You three right there, deathly afraid. Okay, good, good. Appreciate that. I like your shirt. Jesus is the lion though. So, man, roar. I'm, I'm with you, man. Deathly afraid. I remember my first speech class. I was like, I didn't sleep that night. I was vomiting. It was bad news. And you're like, no, you talk all the time. I'm nervous right now. I'm super nervous. I don't know what's going to come out. <laughs> I don't. I don't. No idea. <laughs> what have you been telling God you can't do? And of course, then God's like, okay, you can't do it, no problem. Nope, look at verse seven. Look at the Lord's reply. Don't say I'm too young. I just wanted to stop real quick and look at all my young people, and I just wanna say, don't say that anymore. Let me just look at you real quick. You're like, face like, don't look at me. I'm just gonna look at you real quick. And I wanna give you 1 Timothy 4, 12. Because Timmy got a little insecure. He didn't really want to speak up. And Paul wrote to him, what did he say? 1 Timothy 4, 12. What do you got? Can you throw it up there? Because I, I don't have it right now. <laughs> Let no one despise your youth, but be an example in faith, in word, in purity, in love, and some other things. Don't back away, young people. You might feel insecure, Faith, but you got it. If God's called you to it, he'll empower you to do it. I love being around you. You have a joy. You have a vibrance. You know what um, the enemy will want to do? Squander and squelch your joy. So when you feel like, oh, you're not enough, I don't have enough, all that kind of stuff, that's the enemy, and you can't afford to listen to that, you gotta walk in power because your joy and your presence is gonna help people. And I really believe that. Don't, don't let them think less of you. And he says this, and <laughs> he says in verse, the second half, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. I forgot to give you the first point. The first point was, I can't, I'm two. This is the second point. <laughs> Write it down, wherever, whatever. Wherever, whatever. So God was shifting Jeremiah's mindset. He was moving it to excuses, limitations, to lordship. And that, that's what it is. When you and I are, when we say yes to God, God, whatever you wanna do, the only answer that we have is wherever, whatever. 
And think about this, Jeremiah's story is wild. When you study Jeremiah's story, and I promise you, like, read this. I know they're long chapters. I know it's a long book, but it's super profound because early on, he's working under a king, King Josiah. Remember King Josiah? He was king at, like, eight years old. He finds the scroll. Hilkiah, like, reads it, and there's, like, kind of like a mini revival that goes on for a moment. And then there's another king, Jehoiakim, that comes in, and, jo and so Jeremiah is bringing God's word as a prophet. He's being faithful. No one wants to listen. Jehoiakim takes one of the scrolls. He rips it and throws it in the fire. <laughs> awesome, bro. All my, like, all my preparation and all my notes. I had one guy one time, like I, I wrote my whole message and somehow deleted it like right before, like the day before. I'm like, what, what are you doing here? So burns it. Later on, sorry, you made me feel bad, sorry. Later on, he gets thrown in a pit in a prison for preaching. Talk about being persecuted. And Jeremiah just leans in still. Wherever you call me to go, whatever you want me to say, in the world today, I promise you, and let's, by the way, let's just say this. When we share a hard message of repentance and challenge, can we do it in a tactful way, please? Tactfully, but I'm telling you, most people don't wanna hear the message of God in today's culture. Are we gonna back up? I've backed up, if I'm really honest, in some areas that God's calling me to lean in more right now. Where am I calling you? Wherever, whatever. I was really reflecting a lot when it comes to wherever and whatever, when we first got called back in 2008 to start the church. And I think I told you guys about this. We were in Fort Lauderdale, it was 84 degrees. We were playing football on the beach and it was February. So when we got here, it was like negative 25. And like, my wife looks at me like, what are you doing? I'm like, I have no idea. But I think about wherever, where, where has he called you to be in this season? Is it a new business, a, a, a new career? Maybe it's to stay in a position right now that you're really uncomfortable, but you know God has not released you from. So there's a variety of, of places and spaces that he's called us to be. You know the neighbor that you're like, you just wanna shut the garage, you know? You're like, bro, they're awkward, and it's like, I don't, he, and, but God's knocking on your heart and says, go to your neighbor. Go bake them like some brownies or something and just bring them over, it's just nice and fresh. Jesus loves you. I thought I'd bring you some brownies. Wherever, do whatever, call whatever. I'm gonna be with you. And that's what it is. That's true lordship. I was, when I was studying this, really this message is a message of lordship. Yes, Lord. That's all you say. Yes, Lord. There, it's funny because there was, um, easier said than done, right? But there was a, there's a I wanna show you this back in, Luke chapter nine, there was a story of Jesus was calling people to follow him. And I think there was a lot of fans of Jesus, but not a lot of followers. And he was saying, and he, it was interesting how he would call people. He would like show up at like a tax office at like H&R Block, and he would look at Matthew, be like, yo, Matt, follow me. And Matt would like just leave everything and follow. Or, you know, Peter, I think Peter, James, were they all fishermen? Drop your nets, now you're gonna be fishers of men, follow me. And he was calling people, and there was this one guy, I want you to see it in Luke chapter nine, uh, 61. Listen to this guy. He's like, yeah, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. So do you see the, the, the tension here? Yeah, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first do something. True all-in lordship, God is yes. It's not yes, but. Yes, but is what we call an oxymoron. Yeah. Kind of like jumbo shrimp. <laughs> Pretty ugly. Icy hot. Marital bliss. <laughs> Joking. Come on, come on. Joking. I told my wife the other day, I'm still madly in love with you and you're my, be my best friend. Oh. 23 years later. So it, it can't happen, by the way. There's something about what, what, what 
Jesus was saying it's yes, Lord. It's not yes, but. And then he gives him this great word. And don't be afraid. Look at verse eight. Don't be afraid of the people. I'll be with you and I'll protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out. He touched my mouth. That's the key. And said, look, I put my words in your mouth. I love it. It's interesting because in that text, there's another translation that says, don't be afraid of the people's faces. And it's funny, when I'm preaching, I, I see all your faces, and um, some of your resting faces are yes faces. And this is proven. This is really proven. They did a study on it. Some of your faces right now, you're tuned in, you're zoned in, and you're really, ex you know, you're excited, but your resting face is like this. <laughs> and I love looking at you guys, because like, you could be like, this is a terrible study, but like, you're just resting. <laughs> and then some of you guys, your resting face is a no face. Imagine being me and looking at you. But you're really excited, but you're just zoned in. It's, it's, so he said, don't be afraid of that because I'm gonna be with you and it's actually gonna be my words that are flowing through you. And so I wanna come back to you, young man. What, which, can you elbow him real quick? Um, will you participate in this for me? You said, earlier you said, I fear public speaking, but what if I told you um, I will give you the words to say. Would you come up here right now and tell these people something? Will you do it? Okay, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on up. We, we're just gonna go ahead and just kill some fears today. And I really appreciate that, that you're doing that. What's your name? Jake. They, let's give it up for Jake, man. Let, swagged out Jake. Come on up real quick, come on. All right, so Jake, I'm just gonna give you the words. And this is a good word, because I was thinking about this. This is a word I've been speaking to myself lately. It's 2 Peter 1, 7, okay? All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you the words, and you're gonna give it to the people. Can you bring it up for me if you have it, by the way? 2 Peter 1, 7. For I have not given you a spirit of fear. For I have not given you a spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. But of power and love and of a sound mind. Amen. Let's go. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. This man was filled with fear, but he trusted me to give him the words to say, and that's exactly what God told Jeremiah. Guess what? You know what? You're gonna be fearful, but I'm gonna give you the words to say, and as you follow me and you lean in, you trust me, thank you so much. And you just broke that fear, and I'll just prophesy over you right now, bro, like, don't be scared anymore. You come up, you bring God's word, you send it, you lean in by faith, and watch what God will do in your life. Jesus is the lion, he's gonna fly through you. I believe it. Where do I go from here? I got one minute left. Man. Let me just say this about fear real quick. I heard a, a leader, John Maxwell, say, all fear boils down to two things. Either I'm not enough or I don't have enough. And let me just tell you, God can supply everything you need for his call. Last one, jot it down. God told Jeremiah, part of your call is going to be tearing down and the other one is gonna to be to build up. Tearing down and building up. Verse 10, and we'll close with this. Today, I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and what? And tear down, destroy, and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. What a wild call that Jeremiah has. Great, you get to go tell people how much they've sinned and strayed away, and, and they're gonna just not like you at all. And, and this was a prophetic picture of what would happen to God's people. Because what would happen, the Babylonians would come in 
and they would destroy Jerusalem, the temple, everything, burn it down. But God was faithful to then send his people back to build it back up. And maybe that's what's happening in your life right now. He's scrapping the old, the old pathways, the old thoughts, the old patterns, and now he's building up something beautiful. That's what he does in all believers, if we'll let him to do it. It's kind of like uh, the, t- the TV show Fixer Upper. How many like Chip and Joanna Gaines? I love, I love those, man. If you haven't seen that show, man, download it, go check it out. On sabbatical, I, I watched it like, I tried to watch it every day. Because <laughs> there's a great picture in there, isn't there? And, and, and the best day for Chip, Chip, if you've known it, was, what was it? It was demo day, baby. Demo day. And I prophesied demo day on someone's life. You say, man, what is that? That's, that's taking out the old, man, so the new can come in. Mike preached this great message, drenched to drip. And I was like, man, how many of us, we haven't cleared away all the junk in our life so the power of the Spirit can't flow? So drenched to drip. I got nothing to drip because it's all Todd and not God. I was like, oh, Mike, got me. Let me just tell you an encouraging story, and I'll land this plane. Super encouraging few years ago, we started this ministry called 180. How many, how many grateful for, for 180? <laughs> Proud of you guys. And the whole idea of 180 was patterned off my life where for years and years and years, I stiffed arm God. I was like, no, I'm going to do it my own way. Got involved in a bunch of stuff I was really ashamed of and patterns of, of sin and addiction. And there had to be this point where I'm like, I'm tired of it, God. I need help. And there was a process of eradicating. It was forgiven in one moment, but there was a process of forgiveness and, and, and uh, eradicating a lot of the junk in my life. And that's what we patterned this four months for. So the guys would come in, they'd say yes to Jesus, yes to the leaders of the house, and then start building up patterns and lifestyle rhythms that would set them up for success. And I'm happy to say after a few years, how many men, I'm so proud of you, I'm so, so proud of the men that have the courage to walk through this. One in particular, I just heard this report. He came from Florida. One of his friends went through it, told him about it. He moves from Florida, sacrifices four months, moves to Omaha, totally gives his life to Christ, and talk about wreckage, but now God has rebuilt and continues to rebuild his life. (laughs) Demo day happened, but man, the beauty of it. I love at the end of Fixer Upper, man, it's like, you know, 15 minutes later, the house is just beautiful. It's like, how did that happen? Can I just tell you something? It's going to take time, but it's worth it. It's, man, it's beautiful to see what God can do. Tears down and then builds up. Amen. Did this encourage you? Hope it did. God, thank you for this word. I, I know I needed it. And as we continue to study Jeremiah, I pray We'd receive calls, we'd hear from you, and as scared as we are, as fearful as we are, we wouldn't back down, we'd move forward, trusting you to speak through us, to love through us, to care through us. And I pray for every single person in here that doesn't know you, that you would move in their hearts. I pray for those that maybe are walking in insecurity due to something in their past, a past hurt, a past loss, a past pain. I pray, God, right now, you would release that. Cancel that lie that I'm too, I'm not enough, and replace it with, if I've called you to it, you got it. I'm gonna equip you. I pray, God, that there would be faith that would be built. You'd be glorified. They'd experience your best. In Jesus' name.